Hey there, my friend. It's Dr. Anthony Balduzzi. Welcome back to the Fit Mother Project podcast. Today, it's a solo episode, just you and me, and we're going to be going through some great Q&A questions that we've received from some of our ladies inside the Fit Mother program. Today's episode is going to be focused on some great nutrition questions, and then I'm going to shoot a series of future Q&A episodes to cover things like exercise and additional Q&A questions. So I think I have around six awesome Q&A questions. To give you a little forecast, today we're going to talk about how fruit fits into the Fit Mother program. We're going to talk about what fruits are best, high sugar fruits, low sugar fruits. We're going to talk about why we recommend having a low carb breakfast as opposed to high carb breakfast. We're going to talk about dairy, how it fits into the program. Is dairy actually healthy? We're going to talk about can you have too much protein, the benefits of MCT oil, and then we're going to end today's episode talking about seed cycling and some of the good seeds and nuts to include depending on what time during the cycle you may be. So an action-packed episode. Let's get into the first Q&A. We've been asked by ladies, where does fruit fit into the Fit Mother program? I've noticed there's not a ton of fruit. Why is that? Well, when you're getting your body healthy, one of our main goals is to actually improve your glucose and your blood sugar regulation and your insulin sensitivity. So a little bit of basic physiology to remind you, whenever we eat carbohydrate-containing foods, the body's going to go break those carbohydrates down, and it's ultimately going to elevate our blood sugar levels. Now, that's not a problem in itself. It's a normal part of physiology. And we have this organ in our abdomen called the pancreas that secretes a hormone called insulin. And insulin's job is to grab that blood sugar and then shuttle it into our cells so we can use it for energy. But what's kind of problematic about insulin is, although it's good, insulin's meant to rise, do its job, and then fall back down to baseline. But if we constantly have really high blood sugar levels, and if we're eating and we're getting a little unhealthy, the body can actually become resistant to insulin. This is like pre-diabetes effectively. And if it gets really bad, it turns into full-blown diabetes. I mean, we're resistant to insulin. Our fat burning is lower. It can have a whole host of different problems. So when we're getting ourselves healthy, it's a good idea to have a lower carbohydrate intake. And that's what the Fit Mother Meal Plan is. It's not a no-carb plan. It's a lower carb plan. Now, how fruit fits in is fruit is a carbohydrate-containing food by its nature, and not all fruit is created equal. Some fruits are just straight up better than other fruits, and the best fruits are ones that have the least amount of blood sugar impact but still have a lot of fiber, vitamins, minerals, and good stuff. So first, I want to go over some of the really high-sugar fruits. These are fruits that I typically avoid and only on rare occasion. If I did have a high-sugar fruit, I'd have it after exercise. I wouldn't have it just like at baseline because it is going to spike your blood sugar. Here are some of the high-sugar fruits. Mangoes. There are health benefits to them, but they're very sugary and they can spike your blood sugar pretty substantially. Now, if you're going to eat a mango, it's better to eat the mango when it's kind of like still pretty green and hard because it has more of that fiber. And this is a theme with pretty much all fruit. As fruit gets more ripe, it gets more sugary. So if you eat it earlier in its life cycle, like as we're going to talk about bananas, bananas end up being a very high sugar fruit when they get soft and brown and spotted. Like that's when you don't want to eat the banana. But when it, bananas like has more green on the outer shell of it and it's got the green tip to it or a lot of green on it, it's actually pretty low impact. So mangoes. Grapes, very high sugar. They have some beneficial compounds, but I avoid grapes. They're basically like sugar bombs. Figs and dried apricots and stuff like this. These are very dense sugary fruits. Like I said, the ripe bananas, I I don't eat bananas when they get too soft and ripe. And then pineapple. Pineapple has some beneficial compounds, but it is pretty high in sugar. Now, some lower sugar fruits that don't affect blood sugar that much and are actually very beneficial for your health. All kinds of berries. You want to buy those organic because the non-organic berries are sprayed with a lot of pesticides and those can easily seep into the soft outer aspect of the berry. So organic blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, all great. Um, Buy the berries seasonal and then look at the prices. And if you're sensitive about the prices, you can always buy frozen berries organic. Those are the best. And then the wild blueberries are going to be better than those really big plump blueberries you might see in the grocery store. And typically you're going to find the wild blueberries um, in the frozen section. A grapefruit is another great fruit that doesn't Im- uh, really impact your blood sugar levels that much. It has some weight loss benefits. Cantaloupe is a really great melon. It's very watery and improve your digestion and it's not going to impact your blood sugar levels that much. Kiwi, really good. Kiwis have a lot of vitamin C, a lot of other uh, fiber, and a lot of great things. And I'd say the serving size for a kiwi would probably be around one to two kiwis. Papaya, it's not a fruit that many of us eat on a regular basis, but it is has a lower glycemic impact, and it is has a lot of great compounds in it, like some enzymes that are good for reducing inflammation. And then those bananas that are still green-tipped are really great fruits. So how to incorporate these? Well, 
if you're inside our Fit Mother program and you're one of our members, you know that we do recommend some of these fruits for snacks. And actually, I'm sorry, I, I meant to say on the low sugar fruits. So some of the stone fruits like apples and pears can be really wonderful. Now, when it comes to apples, there are some apples that are more sugary than others. And if you want the least sugary apple, then get the green apples. So those Granny Smith apples have the lowest blood sugar impact and they're also the most tart. So on our Fit Mother meal plan, we recommend fruit is really great for those afternoon snacks because you can pair fruit with nuts or fruit with jerky, and it's just a really great non-perishable snack, and you get a lot of benefits of the fiber. And the fiber in these fruits is going to be net beneficial for weight loss because it helps your GI tract. It helps those probiotics, and when you're, you have a good gut microbiome, you're going to have less inflammation, and your system's going to be functioning a lot better. So we want to incorporate those fruits as afternoon snacks that's inside the meal plan. And if you want to have some fruit with breakfast, you can, but do remember in the, in the morning time, your body naturally has higher levels of blood sugar. The hormones like cortisol and glucagon, these are natural hormones that rise in the morning and they liberate blood sugar to get us energized for the day. So we don't actually need to eat a lot of carbohydrates and sugar to have higher blood sugar levels in the morning. That's why we suggest lower carb breakfast on the Fit Mother plan. But if you want to have some fruit with some eggs or you want to throw some fruit in some of your smoothies, do something like the green tip banana, have a cantaloupe, a kiwi, some berries, something like that. That's going to be totally fine. And a specific question, what fruit is best to have in the morning? Well, you can have a half or a full grapefruit, some organic berries, unripe banana, cantaloupe, avocados, technically a fruit, although there's basically no blood sugar impact of that. And an apple, an apple with some coconut yogurt could be a really good uh, way to start your day as well. Okay, so why does breakfast have to be low carb? That's another question we get. Well, it doesn't have to be. And in fact, if you're following some of our plant-based recipes, we have stuff like overnight oats uh, that obviously has some carbohydrates in it. But remember, we want to keep our blood sugar levels really stable and regulated. And in the morning, your body doesn't need carbohydrates to do that. And if you have a lower carb breakfast, you're actually going to be maximizing some of these fat burning hormones. So that's why the Fit Mother Superfuel smoothie recipes are lower carb. Our egg-based recipes are lower carb. And if you're using some of these fruits we mentioned that are good on the glycemic index and load, then they're not going to impact your blood sugar that much. Next question, where does dairy fit into the Fit Mother program? Is dairy healthy? And now I'll be honest with you, dairy is a little bit of a complicated food, and that's why we don't include a ton of it in like the base mind plan. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't include it, but it does mean that there's some nuance here that I want to discuss. There are many foods that people have food allergies to, and dairy is a main food that a lot of people are sensitive to. Now, in a food, there's a couple different things that you can be allergic to, and dairy is a little interesting, and I want you to understand this nuance. In dairy, there are milk sugars, and there's milk proteins. The milk sugar in dairy, the primary one, is called lactose. So a lot of people have a sense that they may or may not be lactose intolerant. And lactose means you do not, lactose intolerance means that your body in your digestive tract does not have the lactase enzyme to break down that lactose sugar. So when you drink milk, you eat cheese or whatever, you can have an upset stomach because that lactose sugar is sitting in your GI tract and a lot of your gut microbiome and your probiotics are just like breaking down that sugar and producing gas. That is not actually like a food allergy as much as that is a enzyme deficiency. And it is estimated that up to like 75% plus of the world has some degree of lactose intolerance. People who are of European descent, um, you know, oftentimes tolerate dairy the best. People who are Asian or for African-American or African um, or Mediterranean often do have some lactose intolerance. But that's different than actually a dairy allergy or having sensitivity to the dairy proteins. When we have sensitivities, it's often to the protein, not just to the sugar. And now there are a couple different types of dairy proteins. There is casein and there is whey. And when we talk about a milk protein, like if you drank cow's milk, it has both casein and whey. Now, whey is something you'll find if you look at like some of our some of our whey protein powders for super fuel or you hear about whey and stuff like that. That's the least allergenic part of the protein. It's the casein that po most people get in trouble with. And a lot of people have sensitivity to casein. And if you do have sensitivity to casein protein, what you may find is when you drink dairy, uh, you can have a stuffy nose, you can feel a little lethargic, you can feel a little bloated. And casein is an interesting protein. A lot of people do have sensitivity to it. And what makes it a little more complicated is the type of casein is varied depending on where the dairy came from. Cow's dairy typically has something called A1 casein. And A1 casein is something a lot of people don't tolerate well. Sheep's dairy and goat dairy has A2 casein. And A2 casein is tolerated a lot better by many people. So this is where there's some nuance. Like I can tolerate 
uh, sheep's dairy and goat's dairy a lot better than cow dairy. So I always go for those types of dairy products when I have them. And how I would incorporate that is sometimes I might throw some of that stuff on a salad, maybe a little bit of feta, which is always pretty much comes from sheep's dairy. That can be on a salad, particularly at a restaurant. They're going to include those kinds of things. Um, but for me, I know when I eat too much dairy, I do have a mucus reaction, and that might be the case for you. You might find that you feel better with less dairy. But if you can tolerate dairy and you know you feel totally fine and you've experimented removing dairy or diff trying different types of dairy, then dairy can be a healthful product. And I want to say I do recommend most people go for the cows, I'm sorry, the sheeps or the goats dairy over the cows dairy for the most part. And then there's this whole other wrinkle in the conversation where um, I'm a personal believer in this, that I think some of the unpasteurized dairies are healthier for you. Because when we have this process of pasteurization, which we do to kill any harmful potential microbes in, in raw dairy, the pasteurization, this flash heating process actually denatures a lot of the natural proteins and enzymes in the dairy and causes it to be a little more problematic for many people. So there's a big whole world of people going for raw dairy products. And that's what I typically do. The, the main dairy that I get is going to be a raw Pecorino Romano, which is basically like a Parmesan cheese that comes from sheep's cheese. And I'll put that on some lentil pasta as a little bit of a shavings. Or again, sometimes I could have some goat cheese on like a non a non wheat cracker, maybe an almond flour cracker as a snack. And sometimes maybe I have a, a little bit of cheese, but I don't make cheese a staple of my diet. But if it's fine for you and you feel like you can tolerate dairy, you can have a lot of health benefits because dairy has the calcium, the vitamin D, the protein, some good kinds of fats in there, uh, and, and it can be really beneficial. Now, one kind of dairy that I do really like, if you can tolerate it, is kefir. This is a fermented type of dairy that has these kefir strains of probiotics. It can be a really good health-promoting food, and if you can find kefir that's based off of like goats or sheep's milk, wow, and you can tolerate that, that could be a great thing. And so I think dairy can be a great snack, right? It can be something that you can have. Maybe you have some Greek yogurt, or maybe you have a little bit of cheese with the apple in, as an afternoon snack. If you can tolerate, all good. But I would really look at uh, how your body tolerates dairy. Next question. Can you have too much protein in your diet? And the answer is yes, but it's pretty hard to do. So protein is something that becomes very beneficial, especially as we get older. When you have a higher protein diet, which is certainly what the Fit Mother diet is, there's a lot of benefits. Protein increases your metabolic rate. It keeps you full when you're trying to lose weight. It helps preserve muscle mass, which is so important as we age. And we're actually finding that we're thinking about muscle in a more broader way as we get older, where muscle is actually an organ of longevity. When you have more muscle mass as you get into your 60s, 70s, and even 80s, it helps regulate your hormones. It helps your blood sugar levels because those muscles are soaking up a lot of that sugar from the food you eat. So we want to maximize muscle mass, and a, and a higher protein diet can certainly help with that. So how do we define a high protein diet? Well, I'm going to say a diet that has around 100 grams of protein or more is a high protein diet. And I'd say a good target to aim for, and this is kind of how the Fit Mother meal plan just generally falls is getting around 0.6 to 0.7 grams per pound of body weight or around 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. So for a 150 pound woman, this is gonna be around 115 grams of protein. And that's over 100 grams. It might be 100 to 115 grams. That's a high protein diet, but it's very doable. Let's say that you're having three meals per day in a snack. That means you're having meals that have around 30 grams of protein or so, and your snack will have around 10 to 15 grams of protein. That's around what all of the Fit Mother meals have. If you do one of our breakfast smoothies or an egg-based recipe, they're around 30 grams of protein in those morning meals. If you load up one of those healthy sandwiches or do a protein salad for lunch, you're going to get around 35 to 40 grams of protein. If you make a perfect plate and you have around, let's just say, five ounces of protein, which is going to be, let's say, around, honestly, around 30 grams, and then you have some vegetables and some carbohydrate food on the side, that might be another five to 10 grams, you're going to pretty much easily get this around 100 grams of protein throughout the day target. Now, if you have too much protein, you'd have to really try, like slamming it all over the place. The main problems is your body will actually convert that excess protein to carbohydrate. It's just what it does. There's only a certain amount of protein that your body can actually use for muscle building and repair. And then it can end up just like raising your blood sugar levels a little bit. But like, it's pretty hard to like overeat on the protein if you're being reasonable. Like if every night you're having like a pound of animal meat protein, like 
that might be excessive for you. But then again, if you only, if you're fasting and you only have one meal a day and that there you go, that's like 60 or 70 grams of protein right there, that could also work. So it's about your net total protein intake. And I would say for most ladies on this program, focusing on getting more protein is going to be totally fine. And again, if you're eating enough vegetables and healthy fats to balance that out, then your meal plan is going to be really good. And I want to say high protein diets also from the research are fine on your, on kidneys. A lot of people are worried that high protein diets are going to damage their kidney health. And that's just not the case for people who already have damaged kidneys. There is some benefit of a lower protein diet because their kidney is not able to filter out some of the ammonia and urea. That's a byproduct of protein metabolism for healthy people. High protein diet is recommended, especially as you get older. Next question is what are some of the benefits of MCT oil? Does it help with energy, stamina, strength, and shifting weight? The answer is yes. MCT oil is a special kind of fat called a medium chain triglyceride. And basically what's unique about this is like when you get a fat from like olive oil or you have fat inside salmon or grass fed beef, it is a very long fat. There's lots of these carbon atoms that are strung together and the body has to chop that fat up before it can use it. So there's more metabolism required. And MCT is medium. It's, sh it's like basically shorter than those regular long fats. And due to the nature of its chemistry and design, the body can use it very readily for energy. It can absorb it and get it right to energy production. So MCTs are really wonderful for increasing fat burning. MCTs very easily are converted to ketone bodies, which are good for your brain. MCTs are great for pre-workout. So the ways that I personally get MCT into my life is, I, as you see in some of the Fit Mother Super Fuel Shake recipes, we recommend MCTs and smoothies. They're good for that morning energy burst. I will often throw around... Uh, two teaspoons to a tablespoon of MCT oil and coffee. So if I want to have just like coffee and kind of fast, I can throw a little MCT oil in there with some stevia and give you a lot of energy, which is very good. Um, and it's also good if you're, if you're getting deeper into our fit mother program and you're getting into phase three of fit mother 30 X and you're starting to do things like carb cycling, MCTs can be a great thing on low carb days to give you a little more energy and boost. So think about MCTs early in the day as in shakes and coffee, and certainly as a pre-workout, it can add a lot of energy to your diet. I'm a big fan of those. And one thing to note on MCTs, if you have too many of them, so if you're going over a tablespoon up to like a tablespoon and a half, two tablespoons, it can lead to loose stools and a little bit of a gurgly stomach. So be aware of that. All right. So our final question is, hey, Dr. A, I'm interested in seed cycling. What are some good seeds to keep on hand in the pantry and to add to salads or smoothies? So to get into seed cycling, what this is, is the concept is that we can actually add certain kind of seeds at different times of your cycle to help your hormone production and help your body just work better. And this is why the female body is just so amazing is throughout the cycle, hormones are changing and we can actually get the right kinds of fats in and it benefits the system tremendously. So first to understand the cycle, as you probably know, there are two phases of the female cycle. There's the follicular phase and the luteal phase. The follicular phase is day one through day 14. And we're going to define day one as when you start bleeding and you're actually menstruating. And day 14 is when ovulation happens. And then the back part of the cycle, the luteal phase, is after ovulation has happened, um, then the body's trying to raise progesterone levels to actually support a potential pregnancy. So in the back part of the cycle, let's say day 15 to day 28 is the luteal phase. So in the follicular phase, the beginning of the cycle, the best nuts and seeds to have in there for seed cycling is flax seeds and pumpkin seeds. So specifically, let's say you're menstruating or in, in, within the first two weeks of your cycle, you want to have around one tablespoon of flax seeds or one tablespoon of pumpkin seeds. So specifically, what I would do is I would get some sprouted pumpkin seeds, some sprouted organic pumpkin seeds and throw those on a salad. Or I'd also get some organic ground flax seeds and then throw those in a smoothie. So that's something you can do. A tablespoon of each per day would be really wonderful. You're getting fiber, vitamins, minerals, healthy fats. So again, in the beginning part of your cycle, first two weeks, a tablespoon of flax seeds can be great to add to any smoothie or a tablespoon of organic sprouted pumpkin seeds can be good on salads. Now, day 14, ovulation happens. And now at the back part of the cycle, we want to support in the luteal phase, some different kinds of fats. So the back part of the cycle, you want to do sunflower seeds, one tablespoon or sesame seeds one tablespoon. And so the sunflower seeds, again, could be great on a salad. You could throw them in a smoothie as well. And sesame seeds can be great to start to put it on top of any kind of dinner. Let's say you make a perfect plate and you have some veggies. You can put a tablespoon of some sesame seeds on there. You could roast those, use them raw, but that's the whole point. In summary, basically, first part of the cycle, flax seeds and pumpkin seeds. Second part of the cycle, sunflower seeds and sesame seeds. And it's just a really beautiful thing, whether or not 
you are pre-menopause and actually still cycling, or if you're post-menopause, I actually talked to one of the world's experts in seed cycling, uh, Dr. Mindy Pels, and she still recommends, even when people are post-menopause, following the seed cycling because the body, although it doesn't have the same hormone levels by any means, it still benefits from the cyclical nature. So that is the skinny on seed cycling, and I hope you enjoyed today's Q&A. We have a couple more coming up where I'm going to do these solo type episodes. The next one I'm only going to record is going to be a bunch of exercise questions. Then I'll do another nutrition one and then another exercise one. So if you're enjoying these questions, and these tidbits of great info, stay tuned for the upcoming episodes here on the Fit Mother Project podcast. Thank you for being here. Good luck with your health and fitness journey. This is Dr. A signing off. I'll talk to you very soon, my friend.